Okay, so welcome everybody to DevOps Tools for Java Developers. We're very excited to be able to talk, be able to talk to all the folks at KubeCon about how you can uplevel your development skills by adding in a bunch of cloud native, Kubernetes, and deployment skill sets um, to kind of extend what you're doing with de continuously deploying to production environments. Um, my name is Stephen Shin. I run the developer relations group at JFrog, have been a longtime Java developer, and was doing DevOps before we even had a cool name for the for the word. Basically, we were just figuring out how to do better automation to, to production. Um, Excel, do you want to go next? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Steve. My name is Excel Ruiz. I'm from Mexico, live in Switzerland. I'm a software developer, official title, it's principal consultant. I'm a Java developer most of the time, but I also do full stack because you have to be flexible in this world. Melissa. I'm Melissa McKay, and I come from a developer background as well, um, about 20 years now. Um, just recently, I decided to become a developer advocate for JFrog, and I'm hoping that all of my development experience, I'll be able to use that to share with you at talks virtually here and hopefully someday in the future, uh, physically, maybe we'll cross paths at a conference. Oh, yeah. I'm pretty excited to be here today. So yeah, so we're looking, we're all looking forward to to in-person KubeCon back. Uh, my name is Baruch Sadogurski. I am uh, the chief sticker officer of JFrog. Speaking about uh, in-person conferences, I would love to be there with you and give you some awesome stickers of JFrog. Uh, also, head of uh, developer advocacy and uh, being developer myself for um, more than uh, almost 20 years now, uh, I, I really love... Speaking to developers about DevOps, I mean, that's exactly what we're going to, to do now, uh, working uh, with a company, JFrog, that does tools for developers, kind of gives you the perspective of, of both worlds, and um, we'll do our best to share this joint perspective with you today. Welcome. All right, before we get started here, we have a short demo that we want to get started. Are we, um, we're starting with a demo? We're That's actually weird. doing a demo first. Yeah, I know it's incredible, a little bit different. Um, anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, click a button here so that you can see something start working. Ah, okay, so we're not talking about the demo, we're just firing up the demo. That's we're good. just firing up the demo and then we'll talk about the demo later on in the talk. All right. Here we go. Let's so build I'm going something. To trigger it to start running. What you see in front of you is just a simple pipeline. Right. Cool. Uh, yeah, it looks like we have a fifty percent chance of, of this demo working. Yeah. yeah. So and it's actually and look, it's actually times. it's it's always fifty percent. It either works or doesn't work. But but, <laughs> <laughs> but but it improves. It improves. All the last run are successful. So I'm optimistic. It's going to be great. <laughs> Oh, then you know what? Let's let's drop a bomb here. Let's let's ask the big questions. Why should developers care about DevOps? And as I mentioned, I, I come from developer's perspective and I remember what developers care about. And they care about code, right? As a developer, our definition of done is we wrote some code, we tested it, quality is very important, right? And then we kind of show it to all the shareholders we 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 showed what we wrote to a, a product manager to a project manager obviously to QA to our team lead who checked for and they they checked for for all the stuff right if the features are there non-functional requirements uh, the code style and um, the, they did the code review the QA people checked for quality and, and once all of those stakeholders approve and say it's good, this is where we are done. Our work is done. It's Friday. Let's go drink. Now, the ops people, they are going to deploy it. If our code is good, it will be deployed just fine. It will work just fine. And we wish them the best of luck. But it's really not our job to do all the DevOps stuff. Kubernetes, infrastructures, code, servers, networks, this is not our headache. 
why should we as developers care about DevOps? This is exactly the perspective I've had as a developer for most of my career. Uh, we were pretty siloed when it came to um, the actual deployment piece. Um, I was never on call for a deployment or anything like that. Um, it's very different atmosphere today. Um, my most recent um, time in my career, I was on a DevOps team. That really opened my eyes. Um, I did not realize the pains that ops takes to deploy the applications. And once I started learning several you know, things, some of that process, I realized there were actually big decisions I would have made differently about the writing and the organization of the app had I known all of this pain that they were going through. So um, I think this is a good move in the industry. Um, having these silos where you just you know throw code over the wall and then just let ops handle it, I think it's just not the best way to do things anymore. Well, I understand how it helps the ops people. Their life is much easier when we are there with them, but how it helps uh, helps us. So let me let me pitch in from a developer perspective. Um, so I, I think if you if you look at this from from a very selfish perspective, <laughs> um, what we all care about is is how much we get paid as developers, right? And if you look at the Stack Overflow survey, which was recently done, um, you know, full stack engineers and back end engineers and everyone gets paid, you know, quite well. So I think even amid the current pandemic, we're very lucky to have technology jobs. But DevOps engineers and site reliability engineers are actually even higher paid than development positions. And I think this this reflects the, the number of languages and technologies, the um, adding in additional cloud native, deploying to cloud environments or hybrid environments, and um, learning all of these skills and getting really good at it actually is a way of improving your career and, and getting paid more, which, you know, that's not too bad. Not too bad at all. Jill, what is your take on it? Why developers should care about DevOps? Well, I agree with all of you, actually. Uh, first, and the most interesting reason for me is, as Steve mentioned, this set of practices that were DevOps and Agile are here to stay. So outside there, if you're looking for a new job, a better pay job, these are the skills that you have, or the concept that you have to know and use. The second reason is because there are good practices in there. There are good practices that will make your life easier. And when this whole concept of DevOps started, um, probably uh, the best book that describes the ideas behind it is the Phoenix Project. If you have started with this topic in a more serious way, you probably have been recommended this book. I do recommend this book. First of all, it's a novel, so it's entertaining. Second of all, it's going to give you a perspective from management. When this book was written, it was the early 2000s. And at this specific point in time, all companies realized that they, are, they were or they are technology companies, regardless of the product or services they provide. So, and Steve mentioned another important thing. Right now with this, the, with COVID, the pandemic, it is important that we react fast. We adapt fast, we deliver fast. So this idea of going really, really fast and also providing quality, making the, the user happy or providing new functionality, it's really important. So in this book, they describe exactly what Melissa said, the miscommunication of the impedance between different silos inside the company that were preventing this particular company from delivering the software or whatever they needed to deliver uh, in time, exceeding the costs and sometimes not meeting the expectations. So this is a really good book because for us developers, it provides us with a glimpse of what were the management concerns. And when 
you start learning the language of management, you can also talk back. And probably you as a developer, I'm going to have my list of metrics. See, we reduce our whatever for 20%, and then I go with management or different stakeholders, and they are like, but what does that mean? Well, now you have the language of management, you know the concerns, and you can translate whatever you are improving into their language. There's another book, and it's the companion. I like to call it the companion of the Phoenix project. It's the unicorn project. This is the same story. Again, a novel. But the main character is a female developer. And it's going to describe um, the working environment and also the other things that can go wrong in a software development team. So it's also interesting uh, because it provides you uh, a nice depiction or sometimes a not so nice depiction. But you also see that the principles or the concepts or the practices that DevOps is proposing will help you in your day-to-day -day life. So you're going to be a less annoyed and hopefully a happy developer. And that's, that's a great review of those two books. And I would like to suggest, if you wish, an alternative relationship between them. And um, it's interesting both in terms uh, of timing. Uh, the Unicorn Project um, it released 10 years after the Phoenix Project. And it's interesting to see how the views on DevOps progressed during this time. Um, if we look at the Phoenix project, we see how the story of DevOps is actually a story of ops people, of IT people winning with DevOps. You can see how the main protagonist of the story, Bill Palmer, he is a VP of IT ops, and that's like a completely ops concept, and his DevOps um, uh, kind of invention is the solution to the exact problem we spoke earlier of how the developers are done and they are out of the building and now go ahead and deal with it and good luck. And this is kind of a view of how DevOps came to be solving the problem of IT ops people. Now, 10 years later, we see a completely different picture. The Unicorn Project as being an alternative timeline, if you wish, the same company, the same problem, now solved from a completely different perspective. Maxine, the lead developer, as, um, um, as you mentioned, Israel, is, is, um, she solves her problems of a very bureaucratic, rigid, uh, uh, and, and slow organization for her needs, her developer needs, again, by adopting DevOps. So it's, um, it's the same win, it's the same company, it's the same problems, it's the same solution in the end of the day, but it came to be from a developer perspective. And I think this is the ultimate answer to the question that I asked in the previous slide, why the developers care about DevOps, Yes, they didn't have to care in the beginning. It was ops people solving their own problems, but this is not true anymore. Nowadays, the problems of developers, the autonomy, the mastery, the purpose of developers are also can be solved and can be elevated through DevOps. Yes, we have to keep in mind what is the big picture in the software development cycle. And of course, we are one part, we are, I will argue the most important part, but that's me, uh, but we're a part of, of this whole process. And even if we speak different languages, we express our concerns in different ways, we still have like main things we have to follow. And this is something that uh, DevOps practices and agile practices are very focused on. For example, speed, quality, security, having enough information, feedback, early feedback, early failure, whatever you need to go at the speed that you need to go. If it's fast, super fast, it, 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 all, all, it all depends. And also, uh, what do you use? What metrics? What are the benchmarks? What are your requirements? What are your service level requirements? 
those are the information that you need to pay attention when you are in any part of the software development cycle or process. So these are still the commonalities between DevOps, well, between developers, between ops, between management. So it's important and it's very useful at the end of the day. Absolutely. And now let's talk about the development cycle. And the development cycle changed um, in, the, in the last years. You remember how uh, it always been three-step diagram because everything in IT is three-step diagram, but the, the, those three steps were different. The three steps that we kind of were, uh, were used to is uh, uh, write code, build code, and then deploy code. That was the three steps. And today, we still have three steps, but they are different steps. And this is what you see in the screen. The sourcing part of finding the, the building blocks that you are going to integrate in your application is not a new concept, but it matured to be a very important part of our development life cycle. And why is that? Because nowadays, 80 to 90% of our application is uh, taking someone else's code, uh, is the, the open source frameworks, the open source libraries that we use. And most of our code is just glue around it. It's just an integration code between those different libraries. So the process of sourcing, and by sourcing, I mean finding, validating, bringing physically the code to where we can use it and then caching it so it will stay forever and won't disappear under our fingers. This is something that is critical because 80 to 90% of our application will be this code. So sourcing is a very big deal. How do we find the libraries that we want to use? How do we know that those libraries are good? good in terms of they do what we need, good in terms of they're easy to use, user experience, good in terms of they don't have bugs, they don't have security um, vulnerabilities, and good in terms we can actually go ahead and use it. How can we validate all those things? So how do we know if the user experience is good? We need to ask our peers. And here is where the problem of you know, we never considered it this way, come and kind of bites us. If you look at Maven Central as being the primary source for your dependencies in the Java world, you have no metadata that can help you make this decision. It's a file server that you can grab the artifacts and use them. You don't know anything about them. You might write some, you might read some blogs, you might see some conference talks, and then you might decide, well, I heard that, I don't know, JUnit is, is good. Let's use JUnit. And then you go to Maven Central and find JUnit. But the aspect of ratings, of popularity, of user experience is just not there. We need to do our own research, and this research can be long, can be a time consuming and even can be wrong, right? Not everything that has hype around it is necessarily good for you. So what I'm saying is you need to invest your time, you need to do your research, you need to be able to smartly pick what your uh, application is going to build on. And this is where we talk about what's good for you in terms of usability and maybe even quality, etc. Now, the second uh, uh, problem is how do you validate that they don't have security vulnerabilities? And this is where tools like Jeffrog X-Ray and Aqua and Sneak and White Source and Black Duck and uh, uh, there are tons of other tools that can help you validate those dependencies. Some of them are more rigid. They won't let you get this dependency to even uh, to your build system or to your artifact, if they have, they have. Um, if they think uh, this library have a vulnerability, some is more relaxed. They will let you play with it and then fail in in the build time. But in the end of the day, automating this security concern is very important. Another concern is license compliance. Is this 
library even allowed to be used in your organization. Maybe it has a viral open source license, and it means that if you are going to use it, then legally you have to open source all your development. Sometimes it's acceptable, but most of the time it's not, because you probably work, chances are you work in a for-profit organization that wants to make money from the software, and it means that it has to be not free and not open source, right? That's like the default use case, if you wish. So uh, all those questions, they're there in the sourcing and doing your research for what you cannot automate and automating what you can is critical. Now, the second step is the most, if you wish, trivial one. This is what we do for years. We write code, we build, we test, we validate our code. This is all we know how to do. We use our build tools, Maven, Gradle, Bazel, whatever you use, and then you just compile the code, you get jars, you start promoting them through quality gates in our pipelines. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, and, and then you're done, right? You have your artifacts ready to be distributed or ready to get to your users. And then when the third kind of, uh, the, the third part of your um, three steps diagram kick in, and that's the distribute. What does it mean? Well, distributing is bringing it to the runtime. What is the runtime? Everything. Right. So back in the day of like pure Java development and distribution, it was you build a war file and you put it in your Tomcat or your other servlet container, or you build your application archive and then you put it in uh, uh, what was it? A web uh, Web Sphere, God forbid, or or Web Logic, or 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 whatever it is. Right. And but those those days, well, those scenarios are still out there. But there are other scenarios that is re that are reason. Obviously, here at KubeCon, we are going to talk about and we are going to show you how you distribute to your Kubernetes cluster, and this is kind of the, the cloud native use case. But there are others as well. How about edge computing? How about IoT? How about fog computing? or even other people's computers. You have now a distributable application, a Minecraft that people download and play. This distribution scenario is also as, as distribution scenario as, as, as uh, others. So you need to think about that, and then you need to pick tools that are right for distributing for what you want to distribute. In our case, again, it will be just distributing to your um, to your Kubernetes cluster, and we are going to talk about that. Yes, I, I just wanted to mention, Baruch, you are totally right. That's one of the things that are very attractive of DevOps and the practices and Agile, that now our code bases have exploded, our deliveries are also exploded because we have a more fragmented market. Uh, it's very typical for me to go to a client and suddenly they ask you to deliver uh, in different flavors the software that you are preparing and with different requirements. So now you have literally a, a combination matrix of things that you have to prepare, configure, test, and promote in different ways. So it's these practices are really going to help us do a better job. So it's Absolutely. important. Of course. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna dig in a little bit more on one of these practices, which is um, how you um, manage your code that you're doing for developing. And I kind of looking at the the history of software development there there have been a bunch of different approaches to this problem and just just a quick paul from you know of course our, our audience we love to hear from you as well as the the other speakers here so what what was your first version control system uh, how, how about you ikshal you want to go first i'm very lucky i've started with mercurial so yay <laughs> okay that's that's yeah so that's a very modern Version control system, Baruch. Uh, yeah, no, I'm um, obviously older. Maybe not as old as you, but pretty old. Um, I started with CVS and Clearcase, or should I mention, in the terms of your uh, progression here from apes to people from Clearcase, first Clearcase and then CVS. Yeah, Clearcase would be the the ape here. Absolutely. Uh, how, Melissa, how about you? 
uh, Mercurial, and then SVN primarily was what I started with. Okay, so so um, Mercurial and, um, and and Git, which I think what a lot of people are using today, are actually considered the the most modern version control systems. But if you go back in history, um, what we started with were systems like SCCS, RCS. Um, clear case falls in this category too. Commercial systems tend to to lag behind um, open source solutions, and they were they were locking version control systems where you you'd actually lock the files. You'd say this I'm working on this file, nobody else can touch it. You would lock the file and then you'd make your changes and then you'd release the file when you were done making changes. And of course this is this is perfect because you don't have any conflicts. Mm-hmm. Um, now now CVS and subversion, of course this doesn't work for large teams. If you had a refactoring and you changed something across the entire code base, like a package or something that is in every file. You would you would lock the entire code base and nobody else would be able to get any work done. So CVS and Subversion fix this with optimistic locking, which essentially means that you let everybody change the files whenever you want to. And if it turns out that two people change the same file, you go back and you resolve a merge conflict. You 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 try to merge and and hopefully you can automatically resolve the changes. Um, sometimes you can't automatically resolve the changes and you have to to manually resolve a merge conflict. And this takes us to the the third generation of version control system. So CVS and Subversion, you were always syncing with a server. And Git and Mercurial introduced a distributed concept where now you're syncing with the local repository. You have your own version of the entire repository locally. Um, actually, so kind of kind of ironically, this is this this takes us back to the early version control system. So so RCS and CVS were actually initially designed just to be used on mainframes, and so they also technically considered the repository to be local. But what they were missing, and and what of course server faced um, version control systems are missing, is they they're, they're missing the capability to sync your repository with other repositories. So distributed version control systems let you take your repository and do pull and push requests against other repos, either peer repos or a central repo, and give you a a lot more control and flexibility and scalability on your version control system. And if we look at the current trends in this, um, of course, Git has taken over the industry and has become the de facto standard. Um, it's very fast. It's very efficient. Um, it does a great job of merging and resolving conflicts, and it's basically pushed other systems like um, you know CVS, uh, Mercurial, and even Subversion to to be of very low usage now in in the industry. Some folks are still using Subversion um, for commercial purposes, but I think most of us have moved on and and moved to to Git and accepted that distributed version control systems are the the path forward and when you when you look at how distributed version control systems work you have your own working copy of the code which you're committing and updating to a local repository so all of that exists on your your machine and then when you're ready to um to push your code then you push this to the remote repository so you'll actually sync your code with a central repository and other people will pull and push from that central repository and um, a lot of modern workflows like GitHub further introduce the concept of pull requests where you ask people to accept your change and then they'll pull from your repository um, to integrate the changes which you've made, which actually makes it safer for, for merging and code control because you don't have random people um, pushing changes which break the build. And then we, we all get Melissa's favorite analogy, a, a, um, a donut day when the build breaks. Or um, th- there's various other ways of shaming people as well, but I think I think rewards are better than shaming. So donut, donuts are a nice reward. Um, so distributed version control systems make this much easier workflow-wise to avoid having your entire build impacted by this. And I, I think the de facto standard for distributed version control systems has become um, systems like like Git and specifically um, cloud systems like GitHub. So in the Stack Overflow survey, um, GitHub was the highest used tool by developers across the board. Um, can you flip to the next slide, Melissa? The, um, of course, you know we are using Slack and, and Jira and other tools, but GitHub is used by over 80% of the developers 
Um, and then there's a bunch of other tools going down the list, which other folks use. But um, I, I think that when you're looking at how you can manage your source control, work with large teams and efficiently um, create the source code pipeline to deploy to production, it, it makes sense to start with a solid foundation with a distributed version control system that um, um, kind of underlies your entire um, DevOps pipeline. So uh, now, after we spoke about sources, let's see how we move past sources. And as, a, as a, I mentioned previously, this part we know really well, right? We take sources from our version control and then we build them and we convert them to binaries. Now, what are those binaries? Well, depending on the on your stack, depending on the programming language that you use, with Java, we obviously compile our uh, Java sources to the class files and then pack them into those jar archives and then alternatively, or on top of that, the war, fi the war files or the AR, ARR archives, whatever. Uh, in different, st different uh, other languages, it might be compiled two different uh, um, files or not compiled at all. But in the end of the day, we will pack whatever those files into some kind of archive. It will be an archive or, of our JavaScript files or archive or Python's, uh, uh, Python um, files. But in the end of the day, the CI server takes sources and omits binaries. And once it emits binaries, those binaries go to a binary, uh, to, to an uh, artifact repository. And um, obviously, the uh, majority of us here work for JFrog, so we would recommend JFrog artifact repository that you probably heard about, Artifactory. But there are others that are definitely worth you, you, you checking them out. And for the matter of our story, it doesn't really matter. What matters is that you have your artifact repository, which is the where your pipeline actually happens. And this is where the pipeline kicks in. What the pipeline actually means, that you take the artifacts that you have your artifact repository, you deploy them to the right environment for a certain maturity level. So for example, in step number one, you will deploy your integration level artifact to your integration cluster. And you will pack them obviously in Docker container, also in CI server. And this is you, you will you will deploy the container to your integration Kubernetes environment. This is where you do your integration testing. And if the quality requirements are hit, if you are satisfied with the quality of your artifacts, you promote them through quality gates to another level, to another staging area. And what does it mean promote through quality gates? In this more simplistic way, you will just move them from one repository in your artifact um, repository manager to the next repository. You'll have repository for integration, for system testing, for staging, for production, and your movement through quality gates will be promotion of those artifacts from one repository to another. In next repository, now we promote it from integration repository to system testing. We again deploy those artifacts to a system testing cluster, Kubernetes cluster in our example. In system testing Kubernetes cluster, we start doing our tests again, other tests. Now it will be system testing, but it also can be security, performance, um, the, any anything that you care about in terms of what you can automatically test. And again, if the if the tests are failing, well, you just discard those artifacts. But if the tests are successful and the quality requirements are met, you are going to promote it further to staging and in the end of the day to production. So our pipeline is you build the artifacts, you build jar files from Java, and then you build Docker, Docker image from those Java uh, archives. And then once you have this image, once you have the artifact, you go ahead and you promote, 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 promote through the pipeline. 
So just to reiterate some of the points that Baruch has made about sources, I want to drill down into what actually happens at the very beginning, which is the building of everything. Um, there, not, there may not be many times in your career that you're involved in a greenfield project where you can start from scratch and you know where everything is coming from and you know how everything is built and how everything is put together. In fact, most of the time of my career personally has been um, on already established software teams. Um, and my responsibilities are, you know, were around maintenance of an existing product or service out there. There was an existing code base. Um, I may be responsible for fixing bugs, that kind of stuff. Um, given that, it's so super important when you're in that situation, you've just joined a team, part of your ramping up process, know your build get to know your build, get to know the ins and outs of it. You'll be able to work better and more efficiently if you know where everything is coming from and how everything fits together. Um, one specific story I have for that, um, early on in my career, I joined a, a software team and it happened to be a project that was pretty large. There were multiple Java modules all over the place. Um, at the time I was using Eclipse and um, in my, in my IDE and I, I had everything, you know, pulled in and I was really excited to work on this. I, I was pointed to a particular module, a particular bug that I, I needed to fix. So um, I got the code up and every time I made a change, I would turn around and run Maven clean. Well, after a while of doing that, um, it, very inefficient way to work because I didn't understand what was going on behind the scenes. Um, at some point, one of my colleagues came over and was kind of watching over my shoulder um, to answer some questions and um, noticed that this is what I was doing and figured out immediately it was because I, I had not taken that first step to really understand how this project was put together. I didn't understand how my sources were coming in, how they were being cached, how every time I did a Maven clean, I was actually blowing away my cache and just spending a lot of time repeating work that didn't need to be done. Um, come to find out, you know, once I learned how everything was put together, um, I could focus on the module that I was working on and only, you know, build that module over and over again as I saw fit. And I could save about 20 minutes of time every time I would build. So this is something important to know and understand, um, even if you're an ops person, that they, they need to know this too, because building your pipelines out, you need to understand how long your builds are going to take. If you repeat building pieces every time over and over through your software cycle through the pipeline, it's going to take forever. So um, there's a lot of efficiency improvements that can be made there. The other part of this is, um, where are your sources coming from? So now that we're in this new world where containers are really popular, um, this is the thing to do. You, you build a Docker file, you put in, you pull in a base image, um, you write some stuff, you, you know, put everything together, and now you have this image that you can send out there and provide as a service for everyone. Well, there are some specific things to look for. Um, these base images are actually coming likely from default Docker Hub, unless you are specifying a particular uh, registry that you have, which I would recommend um, getting a private registry because you don't know how often these uh, images are going to go away. Um, your base images may disappear. I was on a project once where um, we, were, we were all relatively new to Docker. It, it was pretty new for us. So just getting, you know, getting it built and up and running was was awesome. Uh, we started at the very beginning. Uh, definitely the the um, documentation on Docker. So uh, having something to start with was great. However, as time went on, I came to realize when our build started breaking that our base image was coming from a repository that was managed by a contractor who was no longer employed by the company. Well. Eventually that quit working. Eventually that base image disappeared. They were no longer responsible for it. Probably had assumed that we had already moved it into a safe place that we managed. Obviously that didn't happen. So there was some communication that had to be done to retrieve that base image so that our builds would stop breaking. That's one thing to look at. Another is um, you don't know necessarily anymore um, where 
the if you haven't paid attention to what's going on inside of your Docker file, you could be pulling in external resources that you didn't realize. One example of this was um, I found a place where we were actually pulling in an external script. And then that script was being launched during the build. Uh, not recommended to do that. At the very least, uh, we needed to retrieve that script from wherever it was from and also store that in a local repository so that we had access to it always and it wasn't constantly being pulled you know, over the, um, over the internet to pull that thing down. The other was um, knowing what that script was actually doing. Um, there may be security vulnerabilities being added that we weren't aware of. Um, there could be licensing issues if there happens to be um, third-party applications or installations happening um, during your build that involve installing products that do not have a, a license that is good for your company. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. yes. So make sure you understand your build. That is the whole point of this slide here. <laughs> um, also, uh, note the bananas. I refuse to use shipping containers to represent containers anymore in any talks or any slides. And I challenge anyone in the future to uh, start moving away from shipping containers. So th there, can be, there can be two options here. First of all, we can start a movement of using bananas for everything container related. <laughs> Or we can open a competition for whoever comes with the next best thing after shipping containers for talking about containers. I, I root for bananas. I like it. Well, I, I like to work a lot with containers because uh, when, when we first started in our projects, um, I think the first time we use it, it was for developing purposes. For example, we in the product that I was working on, we need to support several databases. And instead of installing in my local machine uh, Postgres and MySQL, and then later on polluting my, my system folder, now we had the opportunity to create the image or download the image in, if, if we needed to create uh, the specific Postgres version with our own configuration file even better. So that's why I support totally Melissa's idea of having your own uh, at the at the company level, your own repository, because you can do the things like this later on when you're using them for integration tests, you may want to customize it because integration tests usually takes a long time. So they're they're expensive in bootstrapping. The, depending on how many services you have to, to test. Remember, uh, integration test is testing two components. You don't have to test your entire application. You can, of course, do it, do end-to-end -end tests. But integration test, you can have as many different configurations between components. And sometimes because of this, you want to create as different customized versions to make this easier, faster, um, when I started with containers and, and I heard package ones deploy anywhere and under different circumstances, I remember, oh, this is so like the Java promise, right ones from everywhere. So I was sold. Mm -hmm. What was not to like? Yeah, yeah. but uh, I think that the promise of Java right ones, right, uh, right ones run anywhere actually didn't didn't fulfill and it didn't fulfill because dependencies because our uh, application cannot really be isolated from everything around it and this is why uh, even in java works on my machine uh, a joke is is actually a reality right i even with java it might very well be that something that runs on my machine actually breaks in, uh, in any other environment, obviously, including production. And, and I think containers are really the next step of minimizing the impact of external, um, of external dependencies. It's almost like someone said, works on my machine, and then we said, you know what, fine, we will just ship your machine to production. And that's exactly what um, and that's exactly what, what what containers are. We take even more of those um, um, of those dependencies.
pack them even more with our application and this is how we ship. So think about package once deploy anywhere when obviously run once run anywhere is a part of it. The other thing that attracted me, it was a change of how we thought. Uh, Marty Fowler and, uh, has this Snowflake server versus Phoenix server. And it's the same metaphor as the cattle versus pet. Because in the past, we had the servers that nobody knew how they came to be. Nobody knew how they were working. Nobody wanted to touch them because you cannot reproduce it. So they were like, like so dear, even if they were not working correctly, nobody attempted to change it. So now we have to think in a different way. Everything can die at any point. Even we want to kill them at some point. So you have to start changing how you prepare things, how you package things, how you make them run as they should. How do reproducibility starts like being a thing, a really big thing. So yeah, containers, thumbs up. All right, so in this new world of containers and everything, um, in the context of delivering your application, choosing your tools can be pretty overwhelming. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there that you have to learn now as a developer in order to make this um, process efficient and um, get your stuff out into production. So something that I really recommend is make sure that you understand as a developer and as your team um, that you understand what you need and what your goals actually are. Um, not just service oriented, but business goals as well. This means involving representatives from other parts of your company to um, um, come in and, and help to determine what is most important for you. Um, the first thing you need is the list, the list of priorities. Your, you know, is it fast? Is it efficient? Is it reliable? Should it be, you know, more economical? These are all just examples of, of goals that you have, but um, make sure that you prioritize these so that across the company, you're all on the same page, working toward the same thing, the same goal. Um, you won't have pockets of the company wondering why on earth are developers doing this when they should be doing that. Um, these are important things to make sure that you know up front. Um, this picture is of my car. This is my actual car sitting in my garage right now. Um, this is really is a good example of what I'm talking about, especially for legacy systems. This is a legacy car. It's about 18 years old. And um, I in Colorado, uh, the tires on this car right now are likely more expensive than I could get mm. selling this car. <laughs> so when I got into a little accident, um, goodness, more than a year ago now, I got a little dent on the side of the car and it was definitely not worth it to me to take it to a body shop and get that fixed. Instead, I went to Amazon, got a Band-Aid magnet and put it over the dent in my car. So sometimes this might be the right thing to do for some of your legacy applications um, just because that particular thing is not a priority for your business at the moment. So this was something I introduced to me recently and it was a value stream that your IT value stream as in the context is applying it to your entire pipeline, your software development pipeline. And uh, this was interesting to me because so much of these things, we these metrics and these values we place on the final product, the final product that's running in production. But what you also need to consider is every step that you took to get there. It would be, it's really valuable to also come together as a team, um, not just developers, but with um, representatives from other departments as well come as a team and decide, you know, which part, which steps are we taking? That's your, your first thing, whiteboard, what you're actually doing to get your software into production. And it doesn't have to be perfect and it likely won't be, but you need to have that documentation of the actual steps that are taking place. You don't want to get in a situation where only one person knows step three of the process. They're sick on the day of, you know, deploying a fix to production. Nobody knows what to do. You want to make sure to have that documentation. And I don't care if it's a manual step, write it down. 
once you have this documentation in front of you, then you can start going through each one and find out which, which steps are the most costly for you right now as a team. Which steps seem to be causing the most problems for you? Um, which steps can you improve? Uh, one, one idea is, um, this was also something introduced to me recently, it was the whole idea of 1% improvement. Pick one thing, pick one thing in your development cycle and improve that one thing. This, um, this is a, a good transition. Um, this was, really brings back some memories for me. <laughs> How do you deploy? Um, for me, my first DevOps team and my first experience realizing what ops goes through in actually deploying an application, uh, this was uh, amazing for me. Um, ops, I, I was, it was a smaller team. Ops and Dev was thrown together. We had very limited training at the time, other than just learning the word DevOps and learning that's what we're going to do now. And um, we started, uh, the developers on the team started learning the process of Ops and found a lot of complexities in the deployment that we had no idea what was going on. Um, one example is um, just opening the right ports, making sure the right right ports are open, especially you know now that you're using containers, make sure that you're exposing the right things. Um, it was a big deal if you got that wrong. I, there was an entire other team that dealt with infrastructure, and if, if you needed um, to be able to get traffic through a particular load balancer, you needed to know that in advance. So, you know, deploying a piece of software where we have fiddled with that, that, that was unacceptable. Um, and unfortunately, in this particular case, it might take a week to get that change in place and ready. So um, again, the importance of communication between teams and understanding the pains that other teams are going through is super important for a developer. You can't be flippant about that. Um, this particular project I was working on, there were a lot of little shell scripts running around on people's machines, in various places, various folders on a shared drive. <laughs> And these little scripts were what were used, and they, they were patched together to actually deploy this service to various locations, whether it be a staging environment or a production environment. And every time a deploy was done on this particular service, now this was back, you know, you, you always hear deploy fast, deploy often. This was not a service that followed those rules. A deployment was a big deal. Um, we did not deploy very often. And... Um, it's a good thing because every one of those little scripts, you had to find them and fix the little hard-coded details that may have changed between each deployment. Oh, and you got to make sure that you make the script, um, you know, that it is working for staging and um, for production. Make sure that you know all the URLs are correct and blah blah blah. We had a situation where um, accidentally a URL for a test AMQ server was put into a production environment. <laughs> so if you can imagine, this was something that we experimented with. We didn't know it at the time, but we were creating um, our infrastructure as code. We started putting our uh, deployment scripts, all of those little scripts, we got them together, we put them into source control, and we started versioning them for each and every deployment. So I, I don't advise going in and you know making hard coded changes every time. However, that's what we started with, and it was a lot better for us to be able to do that quickly, get all of that stuff in source control, version it, and then um, be able to apply um, uh, variables based on whether it was a, a production environment or a staging environment, that kind of thing. And then we were able we were able to deploy much faster. And we avoided those silly mistakes of putting in the wrong URL in the wrong place. The other advantage of doing that is that now you have the option and capability of of um, going back to a previous version if you need to for whatever reason. It's going to happen. Nothing is ever perfect in life. At some point, you're going to need to roll back a, a release. Um, as we get better and better at this, uh, rollbacks may not be as common as roll forwards. But for a while, I think you know you still need to have that safety measure in place. 
until you get a lot of these practices, you know, really down on your team. Right. Yes. I, I totally agree with you, Melissa. You have to externalize as much of the knowledge as possible, uh, reduce the magic happening because life happens and sometimes the person that knows the magic, it's on vacations and then it's chaos. So you have a bottleneck, a dependency that it's not right or not needed. Uh, checklists. Make sure that you have your checklist all over the place and people know where to find them. Another point, um, I've been in situations where we didn't have the appropriate environments to work with to begin with. Um, you might be able to build it on your local machine. You might have um, external resources to use to deploy something if you needed to just for testing. Maybe there was a staging environment. Certainly there was production, <laughs> but um, don't skimp on your environments. This is probably the worst thing you can do for your development team. Um, I mean, you know, we need a place, developers need a place to test things, try things out, experiment with things. There also needs to be available for uh, the benefit of everyone involved. You need a staging environment. You must have a staging environment. Generally, this is an environment that matches production in every way possible. Um, but it, it, it's the first environment that you would deploy a new version to mm -hmm. when you're in, ready in your cycle to deploy a new version. Um, very important to have. Uh, if you want to test on production, good luck to you. <laughs> you, you. You're likely going to have some pretty miserable user experience um, doing that and uh, a lot of, you know, downtime, if you can imagine. Um, also, a test environment, being able to use your automation that you've built to deploy to various environments, deploy to a testing environment. Um, Michelle mentioned before that, you know, integration testing can be pretty expensive. Um, I was in a, a situation where in order to, an expensive in time specifically is what I was thinking, um, something that we would do, we would add to our unit tests, you know, the like interaction with the database, for example, we would just use an in-memory database, you know, because it was faster. But the problem is, is the in-memory database is not the same. It did not have the exact same syntax as what was used in production. So it's pretty ridiculous to have all of these tests and they all pass and they all run and then put your service into production and everything breaks because of a silly, you know, SQL mismatch or syntax difference. Mm -hmm. um, so use test containers. Containers are everywhere. Containers are good for you. <laughs> you can use them for your integration testing. And um, test containers has a lot of available uh, options for you. You can, you know, grab your version of uh, database that you're using um, and be able to deploy that in an integration environment and be able to use that. You will catch things uh, like um, any API problems. You'll catch any you know syntax problems any differences make sure that your integration environment actually matches your production environment and just avoid that mess so Michelle likes test containers and I know she has a lot to say about them and why we like them so I'm going to hand it over to her oh well full disclosure I really like integration tests um, one thing that Martin Fowler said once is that integration tests, is, you don't have to test the whole system. Sometimes an integration test is testing the, the communication or the coupling of two modules. So you can break down your integration test as you seem fit. And if you increase the richness of this and the different configurations of your test, it's going to be even better for you. Uh, I love this project because I said I started with containers really early on. So uh, we were using containers for developer, for developing, like for example, the databases. Uh, I needed to have Postgres and MySQL because the product should run with both of, of those databases. And so you have your containers like that and you're happy and et cetera, et cetera. When you start doing integration tests, you have to bootstrap all this resources and run them. 
Turns out that at the time where I started doing that, um, I'm a Gradle most of the time girl. Uh, Maven, I also work with, with Maven, but at that time we have different plugins for Gradle. And they were fantastic. They allow you to bootstrap and automatize everything. But um, the functionality that they provide were very limited. For example, you cannot have uh, randomized boards. Yay, so not running the test, integration test concurrently, which is a bad thing. So at that time, it was there were so many limitations. When I discovered test containers and I saw what they allow you and how powerful and flexible they are, because they already have like pre-created uh, templates for databases, even with their own uh, weight um, strategies, very targeted to a specific type of container, database, or different other tools. Um, they do have one kind of operation, it's called Ryuk, um, that makes sure that your containers are well behaved. This means that once they are running, well, they start up, they run, and then they are killed, even if your tests are failing. Because in that years back, um, I would usually get the call from the IT guys, Excel, you crashed the machine because you have like 1,000 zombie Docker containers. And I was like, what? And it was because sometimes the test failed and I, I, we didn't dispose of the resources correctly. There were some workarounds, like before running the test, you kill everything in the machine, but it's not okay. So if you need to work with integration tests, you even the simple ones or the very, very complex ones, I totally recommend you to have a look into this project. It's going to worth your while. And it's easy to set up. And it's, as I said, it's flexible. There are already some uh, predefined um, types of, con of, of containers or test containers, and you have the generic one. So totally recommended. All right, so we're at a KubeCon conference, and I assume there are a lot of developers in this particular audience, since we're speaking specifically to Java developers, although this would apply to any developer, really. Um, what about Kubernetes? In my personal experience as a developer on a development team before I was on a DevOps team, I had little exposure to the deployment itself. Um, my life was all out just, you know, I was in my IDE, I fixed things, checked things in, I was done. Went home for the night and slept well. Um, <laughs> now that I'm on a DevOps team, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, definitely more of a concern for me, like what exactly is going on in deployment world. And uh, along with the automation, um, now that you have all of these containers and everything, uh, the bigger your project is, the more likely it's going to become difficult to manage all of that. Um, Kubernetes is an awesome orchestration uh, tool. Um, if you may not get into the nitty gritty of cluster maintenance as a developer. In fact, you, you know, it's possible you may have an infrastructure team that deals with, you know, upgrading clusters, that kind of stuff. But it's important to understand how it works. Um, there are also managed solutions. So uh, once you understand how it works, um, you might consider uh, knowing knowing the big lift of managing Kubernetes clusters. You might want to consider the managed solutions available out there. Um, all of the big cloud providers have them, um, Azure, Google, um, they're AWS, they're, they're out there um, and are pretty, they're making them easier and easier to use day by day. Um, if you are curious and you want to know more, which you should, as a developer, there are a ton of good resources out there now. Lots of articles, blogs being written about Kubernetes. Um, this one is my absolute favorite. It was It's provided by Azure, uh, called 50 Days from Zero to Hero with Kubernetes. 
Um, each of these, it sounds overwhelming. It takes 50 days to learn Kubernetes, right? <laughs> but each of these uh, little points, you know, there are a, um, a single uh, a blog or a little video. It's not going to take you all day, you know, or all week for, for each of these um, steps here. Uh, day one is my absolute favorite in this um, process here. Um, <laughs> it's, I actually picked up a hard copy of these children's books. Um, it's all about FIPI, which is a PHP app, uh, learning how to live, you know, in Kubernetes land. And it's basically a, a child's, you know, written as a child's book to teach you the basics of Kubernetes. And um, there's cute metaphors in there. Some of them might be a little forced, but that's okay. We <laughs> overlook that. <laughs> There's always a page that is more technical that describes, you know, exactly what they're talking about. If there is any question on how to pronounce kubectl, here it is definitively on page 12 of this children's book. This is how you pronounce kubectl. Another way to learn, um, Kelsey Hightower has a really good uh, GitHub repository um, called Kubernetes the hard way. This really gets down into the details of Kubernetes and um, forces you to start at the beginning so that you learn how actually everything is put together and how everything works. Highly recommended. Um, directly from the readme here, uh, Kubernetes the hard way is optimized for learning, which means taking the long route to ensure you understand each task required to bootstrap a Kubernetes cluster. So, uh, definitely go here to learn. Once you've learned, um, these are some of the things that you're going to need to consider when you're building your app or when you're modifying an exi existing app to behave the best in this new environment, in this container and um, cluster environment. So this comes directly from a white paper available at JFrog. I have the link here. Um, these are some of the tasks that you need to consider, some of the questions to ask. Um, for example, how many times have you witnessed a server falling over because the log directory filled up? <laughs> it's happened classic. to me. Yeah, it I've happened to everybody. It. It's um, and it's just a symptom of, you know, you want to get something out there, you want to get something working. And we have this tendency to focus on best case scenarios and happy paths. So these looking through these questions as a team kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of what can potentially happen in a production environment, things that you should be concerned about and things to optimize on. Um, I like this one, um, data persistency, you know, don't don't persist everything, persist what you need. Um, you kind of defeat the purpose of having a container. Um, it's, you know, make sure you're persisting what you need, of course, because your container can die and go away. But um, make sure that you, you aren't overkill here. Um, termination signals. This is one I, I personally um, had a problem with. It was something I added to one of our services because there really was no graceful way to shut it down. There was no endpoint. It, it was just, you know, kill it and be done. Well, if you killed it while it was actively being used in production, uh, the only thing for your user to do is just, you know, try their process again. Unfortunately, and this particular comes, survey. Yeah, and it comes from the from the pet uh, from the pet concept, right? That you you yes. shouldn't kill your application. Instead, you try to fix it and try to keep it alive as long as possible. One of the big changes are exactly that, that you now need to be ready to kill your application and it should go down very fast. And this is why you need the kill, the kill monitoring. Exactly. And gracefully, um, our services, uh, some of the processes were very lengthy amounts of time. So having, you know, forcing a customer to redo their stuff uh, was pretty painful. And there are many reasons why you'd want to kill you know, you, you may want to, um, you need to work on an upgrade or you need maintenance of some kind. Um, consider, you know, how you've deployed your cluster. You know, if it's possible to only kill, you know, part of your cluster, only some pods, update those and then reroute traffic. This is something that is better for you to do than just to kill everything and be dead in the water. Um, the idea, you know, keep stuff alive, like what Baruch said. 
Yeah, this, this is an interesting idea that I love from containers. Instead of fearing death, you start like thinking it's going to happen. Sometimes I even going to cause it. So I need to think about what are the implications and the consequence of that. So start thinking like that. Exactly. And it is a different way of thinking. It's exciting when you get something up and running and you just want to push it out there, but you really need to think of these scenarios, you know, when it doesn't work. And we're trained to do this in our, you know, our code when you get down to the the details, you know, we're trained to look at a a function for example and make sure that it um, behaves the right way and we consider all the failure scenarios, but bigger picture failure scenarios sometimes get sometimes those get overlooked. So um, definitely keep these questions and these tasks in mind when you're pre prepping your app or improving your existing app for the Kubernetes and container world. Absolutely. All right. <clears throat> so let's go and see what our little pipeline is doing. Oh, and we have so much stuff to discuss, to discuss now over our pipeline. And uh, yeah, let's, let's, oh, it actually worked. Look at that. Look at that. Um, I really love demo gods are with us. Yeah, What's that? Yeah. The, yeah, <laughs> yeah ne never happened. I mean, live demo and it worked. <laughs> I really like the visual this provides of the actual pipeline. Um, when, you know, the just the term software pipeline can uh, sometimes seem like magic. It, it isn't. It is not magic. It is just the steps that you take to um, progress your software down the line. So in this particular pipeline, this is a, a development pipeline. Um, we have a front-end application. Um, this particular one is um, NPM. We're using NPM packages to build our front end. Our back end is built in Java. Um, in the middle of this pipeline, we actually build a container with these two resources. Then we, we publish the container. We put it in an appropriate repository. And then we, uh, we can run some tests on it here, you know, run it through integration tests, that kind of thing. When everything passes, you promote your artifact, promote your container image to the next step in your um, cycle, which in this one is a staging repository. A lot of these tools operate in the same way. This particular one integrates with various tools. Um, this particular pipeline gets um, triggered with a commit to a GitHub repository. If either of um, there's actually three repositories here. One is for the actual pipeline script, which describes this whole process. Um, the other one is the, of course, the front end repository. And the third is the back end Java repository. Any changes to those repositories will trigger this pipeline to run at the pro appropriate place. So this makes it really easy for multiple teams to work together without um, stomping on each other too much. Um, you know, getting their latest changes, that kind of thing. A really valuable thing to have. Um, YAML I, is- I have, a, I have a question, Melissa. So what yes. we see here is that um, what we triggered in the beginning was the front end, uh, the front end uh, build. And that Correct. was like analogous to committing a change into one of the NPM files. Now, and that, that generated like run number 11. When, you, when we look at the backend, when we look at the Maven build, it is run number seven. Does it mean that the now the run number 11, the build number 11, will reuse the outcomes of the build number seven in the backend? Yes. And that's great because we don't need to rebuild the Maven project every time something changed in our front end. Yes. This will save so much time on, on your builds. A lot of time is spent rebuilding something over and over. And also, this is something I've seen too that Baruch, you've already touched on, um, the whole promotion uh, steps and um, going through your, your quality gates. I've seen CI systems and pipelines like this where the whole container is built at every step. That's, you know, or when you're ready to deploy, it's built again. Once you do that, you've lost 
you don't have a guarantee that that's the same container or going to have the same behavior as what you tested. You kind of, you lost all your effort there by rebuilding something. So this whole process of um, promoting or, um, you know, moving the same, make sure your artifact is built at the beginning of your pipeline. And then as you promote to staging and production, you're using the same artifact, the same build. Absolutely. I, I think uh, let's, let's look at some sources now. Let's look, for example, maybe to, wanna, let's, uh, let's see the Docker file, or maybe we can start with the pipeline. Yeah. Or Okay, <laughs> we can look at the, the Docker file. Um, here, uh, a lot of these tools are, are using this uh, wonderful language called YAML. Get used to it because it's not going away. You find it everywhere in ops tooling all over the place. Um, this pipeline product also uses YAML and it just uses it to describe each and every step that we take as long as well as the resources where we um, get our source from, our GitHub repos, all of that. So uh, this describes each step, uh, the packaging. Um, there's also some, you know, you can add conditionals. I don't have a lot of conditionals in here, but you can add conditionals, uh, something to consider what happens if at a certain step the build fails. What do you want to do? Um, really important to look at that failure scenario because otherwise you're going to end up with a lot of you know headaches um, fixing builds quickly because everyone's stalled um, so make sure that you have the you know good messaging um, alerts that kind of thing when a build fails mm -hmm. yep um, this particular product has a lot of built-in uh, mechanisms um, and and you know like Jenkins, there's a lot of plugins you can use. Um, it's kind of nice if you have stuff built in, it makes it a little easier to read, um, but you can always you know, go back to just shell scripting if you need to do something special. Um, all of that is available to you. Yeah, but again, right. let me just reiterate that this is just our example, and we're here just to show you the the, the concepts of the of the pipeline, and not necessarily this particular tool. Uh, if you take Jenkins, if you take uh, uh, Travis, if you take Drone.io, if you take Circle CI, it will be the same principles. Maybe the syntax of the YAML file, or if it's Jenkins, it's probably be like their Groovy DSL will be a little bit different. But but the ideas, the principles of the pipelines are are exactly the same across the board. All right, and you were interested in looking at a Docker file? Yeah, because I think this is where kind of everything happens, right? This is where we see how we build all those parts together, how we bring the Maven build that obviously all the Java developers are familiar with, and the NPM build, which doesn't matter how it works, it's all JavaScript magic. But in the end of the day, in uh, in the Docker file, this is where we bring everything, everything together, right? Right. So here's the Docker file. What this file does is it builds an image using the sources from our repositories that we have. We have some private repositories set up. Uh, we grab, you know, our our back end and our front end, and then we put them together into our image. Now there is a lot that can be improved here in this particular Docker file. As you can see, there's there's quite a few hard coded values. Um, some things can should be passed in, like, uh, for example, you might not want to hard code your, your registry that you're getting your artifacts from here. This is something that you might want to pass in because um, it's likely different per environment um, or per stage, you know, whatever stage you're, you're building your image in. Yeah. Another another idea that can you can implement uh, very easily and then have more flexibility is the versions of the dependencies that you use. We use here 1.0 and 3.0 as kind of a snapshot, if you like, right? We are going to re, uh, re override them every time. And this is obviously a very big practice when you go and build your production pipeline. It's fine for demo, but that's not how you actually should do stuff in real life. Instead, you can use, and this is a very um, kind of popular practice, and it's good, you can use the build number as your version. 
and then your your CI server knows the build number of the particular run can pass it as arguments to the Docker image, and that will be interesting to see how we pass arguments to the Docker image, and you see those arg uh, arg instructions in line number two and three. You can add another arg, which will be your build number, and then you can refer to your backend and frontend components by those version numbers instead of hard-coded versions. And that will obviously work every time because the build numbers change together with that and this will provide you with the consistency that you do pull the right, um, the right dependencies for your Docker build. That makes sense. Um... I'm sure you have strong opinions on this. A lot of Docker files out there do not specify versions. Um, ah. you, you can have base images. It just has the name of the base image, um, other artifacts pulled in, and there is no version specified. And that means that you're pulling the latest, whatever latest means. Um, sometimes you might even see the tag specified latest. Um, Latest is a pointer that is assigned to a particular version. Doesn't always mean that it's actually the latest. So uh, be careful when you are referencing artifacts. Uh, make sure that you are using, you know, that you have your head wrapped around your versions and what you actually want to pull in, what you want to build. But you know what? Funny thing is it's not enough. Look at line four, the from. We specify version, we say we want to take it from OpenJDK 11. And it looks like we nailed the version down, but we actually didn't because Docker tags are mutable and the maintainer of this tag can decide in, all, in any time to change the content of what 11 JDK actually means. They obviously have your best interest in mind. It will probably be security uh, patches and they won't probably build, break anything, but sometimes it might. To avoid that, what you need to do is actually not use what you have in line number four, but instead use what you have in line number five. And this is bring the base image from your own registry. And when you bring it from your own registry, this is how you guarantee that it will always consistently resolve the same, the same build, uh, build image every time you build. So this is actually, even when you specify the version, you need to make sure that you are the one controlling the artifact with this version and not someone else who can actually override the version, whether from good uh, intentions or, or bad. Yeah. True. Mm -hmm. I mean, always aim for reproducible everything, build, construction, deployment. So be explicit. And yes, be careful of where you store, how you store, and take the right decision for your use case. One other comment I have about this particular pipeline, um, it, it's very good to show, you know, an example that will possibilities what you can do. Um, but one thing I would do differently probably is um, definitely uh, use, create images uh, separately for the front end and the back end, because in this way, you can really take advantage of your scaling capabilities. You may want to scale your back end server differently than your front end application. Um, there's some advantages to doing that. So based on load, or you know other performance metrics, you may notice um, some improvements by scaling those differently. So one reason to uh, definitely separate them out into their own services, for example. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, this is just a single pipeline. Um, there, uh, in my mind, I don't. Maybe an ideal situation is that's, you know, you only have one pipeline and that's that's what you use from beginning to end, you know, and it's magic. A developer commits code and it goes flows all the way through to production. Likely, though, you're going to have multiple pipelines. Each team may have their own development pipelines. Um, you are also going to have um, multiple deployment pipelines. You may have a pipeline that is specific for deploying to your staging environment, for example pipeline that deploys to your production environment. And those might be manually triggered. 
you know, if you don't, if you aren't comfortable or don't have enough, um, enough of a security blanket set up to protect you from mistakes, you may want to schedule your deployments, in which case you would have a separate uh, deployment pipeline. Absolutely. Well, this has been really informative. We've learned <laughs> a lot. I love that the four of us have such diverse backgrounds and like we all have some good ideas and thoughts about how all of this should be pulled together. Um, this has been an amazing experience. I hope that everyone in the audience has gotten something out of this that you can take back to your teams. Um, let us know if you have any questions. Yeah, it looks like we have uh, some time for questions and that will be uh, that will be a great opportunity to talk about everything that we mentioned and more. So please hit us up. We're all here and uh, ready to answer. With that, thank you very much and bye-bye. Yep. Thanks, everybody.